All right, good morning, everyone. Let's all rise up today as we come and we worship our great God. Come and we worship him today, lifting up our praise and adoration. Our God never fails. I count on one thing, the same God who never fails will not fail me.
Amen, Lord. We praise your holy name here today. God, we thank you for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Yeah, it's good to be here. And uh, this is the time of year. Uh, we've uh, probably for, I think, the last 10 or 12 years, um, we have the opportunity to host in the Northwest uh, what we call the Northwest Leadership Summit on uh, President's Day weekend. And we have the gathering of about 50 pastors and church planners, 50 or 60 uh, every year, uh, up uh, close to uh, Leavenworth. Uh, just outside of Leavenworth in a little valley. We meet in a lodge, and uh, we spend uh, Monday through Thursday there uh, actually uh, listening to uh, some speakers that are selected out and uh, time in uh, fellowship. And uh, it's also a great excuse uh, for uh, my best friend, Tom McCright, to come up and see me. And it doesn't really take much of an excuse for us to uh, do those sorts of things. Uh, I've known Tom for, uh, I don't know how many years exactly it is. I know it's in excess of 25 now. And uh, he pastors uh, First Missionary Baptist Church down in Porterville, California. And uh, so since he was going to be here, I asked him if he would share a portion of God's word with us. I don't get to hear him preach uh, as often as I would like. And uh, so he's going to come this morning, and I just ask that you would Give him your attention as he shares uh, what God has laid upon his heart there. So, Tom, if you'll come. turn it on. You were supposed to tell me to turn it on. <laughs> I, I get spoiled. I've been at the church there in Porterville for uh, close to 25 years now, and um, you're getting old because your 25-year friendship thing, a little short, buddy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> just, just saying, but, but it, it, it's like um, they take care of everything for me there right? So I walk around with the mic on all the time, but the people at the soundboard love me enough to keep it muted, <laughs> right? And, and then I get up, they unmute it, and I'm done, they mute it again. And so I never worry about that, but um, I know that you were worried about this. I told Bobby, I said, I have really gotten old because I cheat all the time because I use my laptop so that I can see my presentation, but also because I can it's got a neat little button over here. It's an ad sign. And every time I hit it, the text gets bigger. <laughs> and and I, I really like that. It's just so cool, you know. Hey, I can see that. And, and so, you know, I don't have to tell you all that the last couple years, and I'm just going to be honest, have been the pits. It, it ju just has been. It, it's like, oh, my goodness. And, and I, I know that most of us, um, we deal in situations off and on that, um, cause us to be reflexive in our thinking, and, and we think back, and I, and I kind of wondered, um, does every generation have their thing? Does every generation have that thing that they look back on and go, man, I hope I never go through that again, right? And, and this is our thing, and I'm just really, really hoping that this thing's over soon and that we don't have to go through it again, um, but it's important for us as children of God to realize that the trials and tribulations of life, the discouragement, the things that might depress us and cause us to wonder, 
what in the world is going on? It should not be something that takes us as children of God, and I'm going to take this thing off if that keeps happening. <laughs> Do I need to move this? I can't see in the light, so you're going to have to give me a visual cue. Because <laughs> I'll, I'll move. <laughs> I knew that was going to happen. You did it on purpose. You set me up to fail. That's what friends are for. And so, um, I sit there and I think about the things of life that, that just, we've had so many advancements in technology, and, and people would ask, are the days that we're living in now, or were the days in the past more difficult? And, I, and I'm just going to tell you, it doesn't matter what time you live in, um, sin has been present. And, and there are certain truths that are always going to be present with us that we're going to have to deal with. And, and, you know, technology may advance, and because of our advancements in technology, we have to stop and ask the question, have they actually been beneficial to society? Now, from a comfort standpoint, um, uh, the, where I live in California, yes, air conditioning is a must. Right? Um, I had an older pastor friend of mine, a mentor in the ministry, who once said, you know, when everybody wants to talk about the good old days, he reminds them of slatted pews and funeral fans. Right? And, and if, for those of you who don't know, um, they're not comfortable, they're not pleasant, and that's part of the good old days. You want to drive your, your 55 Chevy across country? Or would you rather have a, a modern car with air conditioning and, and shock absorbers that actually work and, and make the ride comfortable? And, and so there's a lot of things about the good old days that aren't so good. They're just old. And, and so we understand that. And, and um, I, I get careful because I'm becoming one of them things that's old. And, and I realize that about myself. But it's like, you know, we've got these wonderful inventions. One's called a television, right? They have cameras that we can see everything that's going on around the world. And I ask you, is that really a good thing? Man, there's some stuff going on in the world that's just discouraging, depressing, and actually fearful, right? You look at that and go, man, what in the world is going on? What is wrong with people? Now, I'm going to use a word. I'll try to only use it once because I know it's offensive to some, but it's just me. I was going to wear my mask for this part so you wouldn't hold it against that Tom McCrite guy, but anyhow. It, it's like, I'm sorry, people are just getting stupid. <laughs> it, it, it's like... What is wrong with you? What made you think that was a good idea? What made, and, and so we've got these wonderful things, and, and we've got our inventions. And, and, and so, but when we look around and we see people starving around the world, we see conflict in the Middle East, we see conflict in Eastern Europe, and all of this goes on. And, and sometimes it would be nice to be that young boy back in the 70s that was isolated from all of this stuff, that didn't know all of this stuff was going on. Right? It, it, just, it was a peaceful time. And, and so for us as children of God, looking at everything that's going on, we have got to ask ourselves, what is my response? How am I going to respond in the world in which I now live? How am I going to represent the kingdom of God in the world in which I now live? And, and in 1 Peter, 1 Peter, the, the first chapter, I think if you look at what, what Peter wrote and the things that he wrote to the different believers who were spread out through Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, Bithynia, right? The things that he is writing to them, I think, are designed to help them understand that there's a better way to live. There's a better way to live, and there is um, a, something that's necess necessitated for us as children of God, and that is being positive in these days of discouragement, in these days of disappointment. And, and, and so, as Peter's writing, he goes on in the second verse, and he says, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ, grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his abundant mercy, has forgotten, has begotten us again, to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven 
for you. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you for the instruction that's found within it. Father, I just pray that you'll clear our hearts and our minds of the cares and distractions of this world, that we may give ourselves over totally to the leadership of your spirit as he endeavors to lead us and guide us into all truth. Father, I pray that you'll use me now as an instrument in your hands. Forgive us where we fail you, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. And, and so, so Peter writes this letter. And I like how when you're looking at Peter and you're looking at some of the things that he says, um, a guy by the name of Vince Hanover wrote this. He said, God uses broken things. It takes broken soil to produce a crop, broken clouds to produce rain, broken grain to give bread, broken bread to give strength. It is the broken alabaster box that gave forth the perfume. It is Peter weeping bitterly who returns to greater power than ever. I, I, I like the mindset that, that's incorporated in that because if you look at yourself as something that's broken or unuseful in the sight and the service of God, I, I love you enough, you don't know me, but I'm just going to tell you, you're wrong. There's not a one of you in here that God cannot use for his honor and his glory. Whatever you've gone through, whatever you're going through, whatever you're going to go through, it's a journey in your life that you can take with other believers and with God that can lead you to the place where God can be honored and glorified in the process of your growth and development. Peter in other places says, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And beloved, that is our challenge. That is our mandate. That is what we're commanded to do. As long as I draw breath, I need to try to grow up. Now, there used to be a time when people would tell me that. Brenda still tells me that all the time. But it's like, grow up spiritually. You understand that? Grow up spiritually. And so, when we look at it, um, Christians' times of trials and tribulations, being positive in these days of discouragement is so important. You're, it's kind of like the gardener. And that's the other thing that I tell people all the time. I was raised on a dairy farm in the middle of central Oregon. And, and so... Um, I've told most people that if the end's coming and things are going to get really, really bad, in other words, you can't go into your local store and buy food, most of you are going to starve to death because most of people don't know how to garden anymore. Most people couldn't raise their own food, couldn't hunt for their own food, couldn't do these things that sustain, right? I, I mean, most people think that they go into a, that, that, that white gallon container in the stores, just how it, there it is, right? They don't know what it takes to get it from where it is to where it came from. And, and so we as children of God, um, we don't want to be like a gardener who, man, he took such pride in his lawn. He had the lawn. It was beautiful, beautiful lawn. And one year, all of a sudden, it was full of dandelions. And I mean, this guy, he tried everything he could to get rid of all the dandelions. And I mean, he worked and he worked and he worked. And finally, he was so upset, he called the ag department and said, listen, I've done this and this and this, and nothing seems to take care of this problem that I have. And the guy politely said, in, in response to the question, what shall I try next? Try getting used to them. <laughs> and it's like, wow, trials and tribulations, disappointment, bitterness, get used to it. That's part of life. Why? We are sinners saved by grace. There's only two types of people in this room. There are lost sinners and saved sinners, but we are all sinners. And if you ever lose sight, child of God, of the fact that you are a sinner saved by grace, man, you're setting yourself up for heartache because the devil, you are prime picking. He's going to take your arrogance and pride, and he's going he's to knock you down. And then who will you be, right? And, and so I didn't see Randy sitting over there. Hey, Randy. <laughs> I, all we need is Ken, and we could have a quartet. <laughs> But it's like, I want to give you four reasons real quick to be positive in these days of discouragement. And we're going to find them in what um, Peter said to these people who were scattered throughout this region. In verse number two, he said, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. I like how um, Robert O'Brien put... Um, this information out. He said that desert-dwelling Bedouins came straight out of biblical history, but they don't live in a land flowing with milk and honey. 
They eke out a hard existence, either as rootless nomads living in tents across the Middle East and North Africa, or as cultivators who have gravitated into a more settled life in concrete and stone structures. He goes on to say, even for Bedouins who live in houses, their nomadic past shapes and dominates their mindset and their worldview. Now think about that for a minute. What's your mindset? What's your worldview? How, do you look at things through the lens of the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, through God's word, or do you look at things through the lens of a totally different type of philosophy that maybe, you know, maybe it was your parents' philosophy, maybe it's something you were taught in school, I, I don't know. But it's like everything that you think, everything that you say, every way that you respond to whatever the situation may be is governed by something. Does that make sense to you? It's governed by some. It's governed by what you believe. It's governed by what's important in your life, what your priorities are. And, and so the people to whom Peter was addressing here, man, they're strangers in a foreign land. They, man, they're scattered throughout the Roman Empire, and, and these believers were living in provinces spread from Asia Minor to northern Turkey. And, and they were all over the place. And why did they leave Palestine? Well, Acts chapter 8, verses 1 through 4 tell us that it was because of persecution. There was a great persecution that came upon the believers there at the church in Jerusalem, and they scattered. And, and so, not only did they leave there, that's going to really bother me. My laptop falls, you owe me a new one. Uh, not, only, not only were they strangers because they were living in a foreign land, they were also strangers in the world. Why? Because our citizenship, beloved, is not here, it's in heaven. I'm just a sojourner passing on through. I'm just an ambassador for Christ. And, and those are terms that the scriptures use to describe us as children of God. And, and so realizing that we are just, you know, passing through, you know, Philippians chapter 3, verse 20 says, for our conversation, literally our citizenship is in heaven. That's who we are. That's where we belong. And, and so these scattering Christians of Peter's day were subject to this misunderstandings, to the threats, the insults, the persecution, and even the abuses of a pagan culture that didn't like them. And so it inflicted, oh, you're getting, ooh, I'm getting fancy. I just got upgraded. <laughs> wow. Nothing says loving like a table. And he even moves things. Wow. I don't know what you're paying him, but you need to give him a raise. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> oh, my goodness. It, but it's like, so as believers, has there ever been a time in, in our lives or our existence where you thought that, man, the world just doesn't seem to tolerate us much? The world seems to kind of want to belittle us, put us down pigeonhole us or whatever. I was amazed in, in, in watching the news. There's actually a, a political figure in another country who's on trial for hate speech because she posted a verse of scripture. And I'm like, we look at something like that, oh, that's such a shame. Uh, beloved, don't kid yourself. If you don't think that's coming here to the good old U.S. of A., you're just <laughs> kidding yourself. There are people that would right now categorize the Bible as hate speech if they could get away with it. And the minute that there's 51% of them and only 49% of us, it's going to happen. And you say, well, man, you're depressing. No, I'm just, this is the world we live in. And regardless of what the world says, I'm going to continue to try to be an ambassador for Jesus Christ. I'm going to continue to try to spread the word of God, to teach the gospel of Christ, and not allow the world to dictate to me who I am or what I'm going to do in my walk with him. So in this letter that Peter's giving, he's trying to give encouragement to the, to the believers. And, and these people were finding themselves isolated and, and alone from other believers sometimes. And, and so one of the reasons that we need to be positive in these difficult days is, is that God has an amazing interest in us. God has an amazing interest and an unbelievable love for each and every one of us. And, and so because of who God is and what God means, you look at that second verse there, and each, of the, each person of the Trinity is represented. The first thing we see there is that it refers to the elect. The elect. Literally, for a farm boy like me, that's an easy word for me to understand because it's literally the boundaries that are being set and established for um, salvation. 
In, in other words, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Those are the boundaries. So you understand um, fence lines and boundaries, right? And, and so on this side of the fence, our cows could graze and our cows could wander. And on the other side of the fence were the neighbor's cows and, and whatnot. But that's the property line. And, and so we've got a boundary that's been established by God. And, and that boundary set up what the requirements were for somebody to be saved. And, and so when you see that word, don't let it intimidate you. Yeah, God chose beforehand what the boundaries would be that would enable people to be in a relationship with him as a dear child. That's what that carries with it, the idea that it carries with it. That's why in Ephesians chapter four, 1 and verse 4 it says, just as he chose us in him, love prepositions. You, you ignore them, don't you? That's why it's only two letters. That little two-letter word, in, awesome little word, right? It, it's called a preposition. No, this isn't an English class, okay? Because Brenda's over there taking notes to correct me. So it's like, <laughs> it's in him. You are in Christ Jesus. The moment you repented of your sins and accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, beloved, you entered into a relationship with him that placed you in a positional relationship, safe and secure within Christ, and, and nothing can separate you from the love of God that you have in Christ Jesus our Lord. And, and so that is what he says when he talks about before the foundation of the world. He set out the property lines, the boundaries before the foundation of the world in order that we should what? Be holy and without blame before him in love. In love. It is, it is an awesome thing, and that's why, God, that's why we're told, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him, isn't it amazing how wonderful the, and all these little prepositions are? They're all over the scriptures. You learn about prepositions, and it'll just blow your mind um, as far as the positional relationship that exists between us and God. But, but we should not perish but have everlasting life. If, if you get nothing else out of what I say, pay attention. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, beloved, God loves you. Christ died for you. He paid for all your sin upon the cross of Calvary. And if you'll repent of your sin, if you'll acknowledge that and you'll turn from it and, and accept Jesus Christ as the payment for your sin, God will save you right now where you're at. Whether you're here, whether you're joining us online, whatever the case may be. And it is my hope, it is my prayer that nothing will keep you from responding to God's invitation in your life. And so when we look at this, so we've got the Father who elected us, we've got the Son who shed his blood for us, Right? And, and when you stop to think about that, Romans chapter 5, verses 6 through 10, for when we were still without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Then you look at that. And, and so remember who Peter's writing to. And, and he's primarily writing to a group of Jews who've been scattered abroad because of the persecution back in Jerusalem. And he's writing to these individuals who had been brought up in Judaism. They knew their Old Testament. They knew the things that were contained there. They understood about the activity of the high priest on the Day of Atonement when he would take the blood into the Holy of Holies and he would sprinkle the mercy seat seven times. And, 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 and so now we've got the Lord Jesus Christ himself who has taken his own blood up to the throne of God, that place that prior to that was still a seat of judgment of, of guilty sinners, and his blood was sprinkled there, and it gives his life as the payment for our sin. And, and that judgment seat is a throne of grace, is a throne of mercy, 
is that is a place that we can go to and and in interact with god so christ shedding his blood shows us the intense interest he has for us the the amazing love that he has for us and it's incomprehensible to imagine a love that is so deep and a love that is so abiding that he would sacrifice himself for us he who knew no sin took upon him our sin paid for all i usually try to explain to people Imagine the totality of your sin, right? And I'll pause because some of you have very vivid imaginations, <laughs> right? Now, as you imagine the totality of your sin, now multiply that by the billions of people who have been, who are, and who will be. And Jesus paid it all. Now, you sit there, and, and, and all you do is think about your sin, but as he sweat, as it were, great drops of blood, from the stress of taking upon himself the totality of all sin that had ever been, that was and would ever be, and making sure that he was paying for it through his sacrifice on the cross. We can't fathom. We can't fathom. And so not only did did the Father work, not only did the Son work, but the Spirit was working in us. I, I, I like how... It, it talks about this process of sanctification. Uh, there's a big, big theological word, but it literally talks about being set apart to make holy. And, and so God doesn't stop working in you and me at the moment we get saved. God continues, the indwelling presence of the Spirit of God takes up residency within us. He is there to lead, guide, and direct us according to the Word of God, according to a submissive nature when we are willing to humble ourselves and say, Lord, here am I. What would you have me to do? The Spirit of God performs that ministry of sanctification in our lives with, with the goal that every child of God would grow up into maturity become a mature child of God so that you are ready, willing, and able to serve him. Peter ends that section by saying, grace to you and peace be multiplied. And I love that phrase, grace to you. It kind of carries with it the idea of be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Man, there is joy and peace in knowing that God has such a profound interest in each and every one of us, that he has a love for us that should be infectious and should influence how we live our lives. Um, in verses 3 and 5, God has given us a new birth. He's given us a new birth. And, and he, he starts out there in verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and what Peter is, you know what Peter is talking about there? He say, praise God. Praise God. Blessed be the God. And when you hear that, most of us parents will, will occasionally praise our children, right? Good job, you know, we'll encourage them, we'll praise them. Have you ever heard, have your children ever praised you? Your, have your children ever said, man, dad, you're doing a good job. You know, mom, you're, you're, you're doing a good job. More than just because you cook their favorite meal, right? Or you wash their favorite clothes. It, it's like, no, and, and what he's talking about there is the need that we should have as children of God to praise our heavenly father for who he is and what he's done and what he means in our lives. And, and Peter's laying that out. And, and seriously, if we have no other reason that we should praise God, we should praise him because we're born again. If you need something to praise God about, if you're saved, if you're here this morning and you are a child of God, man, praise him for that. I mean, praise him for the fact that you have the gift of eternal life and a place prepared for you in heaven. And, and so that's a new birth. It's the very foundation or the very beginning of our relationship with God. And it, it, it was entirely upon God's initiative that we've been included in his family. I love the idea. Uh, my older brothers always told me that I was adopted when I was little, right? And, and there were days I really wished I had been. <laughs> Go back and find the biologicals. It's, 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 anything's got to be better than this. But it's like uh, realizing that I've been adopted into the family of God. Man, the moment I repented of my sins and accepted Jesus Christ as my personal Savior, he took up residency within my heart. I became a child of God, adopted into the family of God as a recipient of the gift of eternal life. And it's like, wow, all of that happens in a bam. Isn't that exciting? God, God is so powerful. He hears the, the repentant prayers of people all over the world. And the second that they go to him, he responds. 
And, and so we need to understand that we have a living or a lively hope. We also need to understand that we have a matchless inheritance, right? This matchless inheritance is um, incorruptible. It's undefiled. It won't fade away. It's not like those medals that they're giving out at the Olympics. You know, eventually they'll, they they'll won't have the shine and the luster. Now, people in Peter's time, they didn't understand about medals. They got it. They got a crown wrapped with the leaves. And when you first got it, it was valuable. It was precious. It was, whoa. But it would fade. It would fade with time. But everything that God gives to us, it never fades away. It is eternal and reserved for us in heaven. He goes on in verse number five, and he talks about that we have an assurance of that ultimate deliverance that is provided to us through the gift of eternal life that has been given to us through Christ based upon our repentance. And, and so this inclusive result is that eternal bliss in the presence and the service of God for all of eternity, to be and dwell in the presence of God once we depart this life. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 9, it says, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. I have a very vivid and active imagination. Um, I don't hallucinate as much as I used to, but it's like, it's like, oh my goodness, I can't even imagine all that it is that God has in store for me. I, I'm just, yeah, we read about the streets of gold, we read about all of the ornate beauty in the, in the book of Revelation, but I, I believe that apart from an experiential knowledge, there is no way for us to fully grasp. And, and that's what Paul was saying. We don't know. And for somebody like Paul to say that, it's like, man, that's pretty powerful. But Philippians 1, 6, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. The work that's been started in you is an eternal work, and it, it is going to keep on going on. So that expectation of our bodily resurrection, is, which is reversed, it reversed sin's curse on us, that inheritance which has been guaranteed to us as, as part of that eternal wealth and, and what we need to rejoice over, and, and the abundance of that um, assurance that comes from that ultimate gift of eternal life of salvation, which will free us from the very present sin that we now have to deal with, from the trials and tribulations, from the things that might depress us and discourage us and cause us to get upset. You, you all don't get upset, do you? Do you ever get aggravated at stuff that's going on? According to your pastor, you're all peaches. You're just, you know, and, and just a little cream on top and wonderful, right? If you're thinking that about yourself, he hasn't said anything, but I'm, I'm here to tell you what, I've pastored longer than he has, so y'all just people, <laughs> right? <laughs> and we know what people are like, right? So I'm going to quit because you're not my church, and so... <laughs> I might want to come back here sometime, never can tell. But it's like loving God, being excited about who God is, helps us to understand that God has a purpose for our trials. That's what verses 6 and 9 are getting into. And in this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you've been grieved by various trials. Rejoicing in trials should not be in the same sentence, should they? Right? He put rejoicing in trials in the same sentence. And those are two things that it's like, man, these are worlds apart. Why in the world would I want to rejoice in trials? But the Christian's joy, we need to understand, should be acknowledged as being independent from our circumstances. I never stop being a child of God. Never. Never. And, and so my response should represent that fact. So should yours. And, and so, I mean, it is, it's an encouraging aspect uh, of trials is that they're only temporary, right? I, I have to confess, I am I'm excited to get a glorified body. I am excited to, to depart this and get there. Why? Two back surgeries in a lifetime is too, too many. 
Okay, I, I'm not looking forward to a third. I just, uh, Lord, if you want to come now, that would be awesome, right? And, and it's like, well, you should rejoice in that. Well, you tell me what your pain is, and I'll tell you you should rejoice in that then, okay? <laughs> Let, let's just be fair here. But he, but he says that one encouraging aspect to all of our trials is that it's temporary. He said, for a season. And, and so... Man, we should be comforted by that. But what I find is interesting is Peter's use of the word precious. He uses a word that carries with it the idea of precious. And now I'm going to offend the majority in here, but that's okay. Um, that's a woman's word. Precious, right? It's like everything's precious. Precious. You ever hear a guy go out and say, oh, that's a precious car. I got a precious tractor. Boy, that tractor and that disc, they are precious. Again, I was raised on a farm, and we heard some of the locals talking like that. I was like, well, yeah, good to see you. See you later. <laughs> right? And uh, your tractor ain't precious. It just hope it works. And so here you got this burly fisherman, Peter, right? And all of a sudden, he's talking about precious things. Wow, Peter, man up right? Did you turn your man card in, or what, what's going on with you, dude? And, and it's like, he says that the trial of our faith is more precious than gold. Why in the world would Peter say that? Well, he said it under inspiration of the Spirit of God for one reason. But what we get out of this is because God uses the trials and tribulations of our life to make us better, to grow us. And, and so he's looking at the end result of our trials, not the process. Man, we just care about the here and now, don't we? This hurts, this is disappointing, this is sad, this is bitter, this is, makes me angry. We, that's all we see in the moment. And it's not until the end that we can reflect back upon the whole experience and, and hopefully recognize and identify some growth in our lives. And, and, and so we know, how is gold purified? Do what? Fire. Through fire, okay. So, so this intense heat, right? And so when the gold reaches that certain temperature, the, pure, the unpure stuff floats to the top and, and they skim it off and, and that's how you can get your Krugerrands at 99.999% pure, right? Um, and, and, and so these guys understood that God uses the trials to make us more like he wants us to be. Trials test the genuineness of our faith. Have you ever noticed somebody who got saved, got baptized, joined the church, all on fire? Man, they couldn't wait to do everything that anything that anybody would ask them. They wanted to tell everybody about Jesus. And now you look around and where are they today? Right? They, they've lost their enthusiasm. They let the trials get the better of them. And, and so trusting in the Lord... Like James says in James chapter 1, verse 3, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Okay. How many of you raise kids? <laughs> God bless you, I see those hands. You know, and like, yeah, there's patience in that, right, Brad? Or do you just let Andrea take care of all that? <laughs> okay, I'm sorry I brought it up. Anyway, it, it's like, I got four kids. Love them all. They all moved away from mom and dad, which is okay with dad, as long as they would have left the grandkids, <laughs> right? <laughs> I love the grandbabies. Leave the grandbabies. You can go, go, be free, fly. But it, it's like the working of your faith is worked over through the testing of it. You don't know how faithful you'll be until times get hard. You don't know how faithful you're going to be when you have to respond to somebody who puts a challenge to your faith. It's easy to stand up here and say, I am a child of God. I serve the king. I'm going to serve him faithfully till the day I die. You know, I have this moment right here to make a choice who and what I'm going to do, what I'm going to say, how I'm going to act and respond. And I hope and pray that I remain faithful. 
I hope and pray if you're a child of God that you live faithfully, that you walk in a way that honors and pleases God. And, and we need to allow God to live in us and through us in this time. In verses 10 and 12, he says, of this salvation, we live in some awesome times. I mean, of this salvation that he's talking about, guess what? The prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that, not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering to you. Did I kill it? No, it's still on. Okay. Those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven and things which angels desire to 10 and 12. Go home and read that. But what you know is that Old Testament prophets were very curious about salvation and grace. And man, they were excited about the good news concerning the Messiah, about God's plan of redemption. But they didn't understand it all. They didn't have a clear picture of all that was going to come to pass. And so God had revealed to them the truth about Christ. have the complete word of God and, and the testimony of time to reveal to us the truths of scripture and the power of God to transform and change lives. We are living in a great time where we all can have our own Bible. We can have it in digital form. We can have it in maybe we've got all of this and it's a great time to be alive. It's a day in which the grace of God is He sent his son into the world to die for, for each and every one of us, pay for all sin. But in the Old Testament times, um, and, and you need to understand this about There will always only ever be one plan of salvation, and that is when an individual puts their faith and trust in God and accepts the gift from God that he will deliver them from the penalty and consequences of sin, death, and hell. trying to figure all of that out we today we can look and see what has transpired man even the angels desired to know even the angels wanted to know themselves as to precisely what salvation was really going to be all about and how it was going to unfold we have the privilege not only of fully understanding it but actually possessing it and pro Jesus Christ and share it with a lost and dying world in a way that hopefully God can then take and, and penetrate the heart of the hearer to convict them and draw them unto him before it's eternally too late. You are called to do that. That is your calling. Their job, listen to me, I wasn't asked to say this. job is to live out the all things of Jesus Christ as an example before you. It is your job to in your your going, as you go, as you journey through this life, you all I'm not making that up. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. of every believer we are a believing priesthood of uh, to take the gospel that has been shed abroad in your heart and share it with the world share it at least share it within your family share it with people so that they too might come to know him and accept him 
before it's eternally too late. Um, I want to leave. Does the word of God have an effect upon you? In other words, are, are, are you more positive about today? Do you live like you have a relationship with God? In other words, the other six days when you're not here, child of God, by the things that you say, by the way that you act. Beloved, we should be some of the most is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Um, Bobby told me if I come down off the oh. <laughs> Heard, uh, with us this morning uh, this portion of God's word um you know, God, God does have a plan, and uh, I'd have to say that I would concur with him. The last two years doesn't seem like a part of any good plan, does it? Uh, but I know that God does want to work good for that. Uh, I want to leave you with uh, just some thoughts, uh, maybe a summation of what Tom has shared in First Peter from us, that uh, God has our best interest at heart. Um, he has looked at... Uh, time as it will unfold before us and the events that are going to happen in our life and he has our best interest at heart and uh, I know that it's not always easy to keep that in the forefront of our mind but as we respond to that uh, as we uh, work out uh, that plan in our lives um, it's important that we remember that uh, God be glorified in the way that we respond to what he brings into our life. Um, believing that God has something good, even when maybe the things that are going on around us aren't always good, uh, means that we believe uh, what God says and who God is, and that it impacts our life. And I think that uh, probably there's nothing that uh, really makes a louder statement about who he is and uh, what he has said. Um, this morning, uh, I pray that uh, God's word will not remain uh, something that just fell on our ears, uh, but that it will uh, touch our hearts too and influence the way that uh, we live our life this week. Um, we're going to finish up uh, this morning. I want to thank each of you for being here. Uh, but I don't want to leave without offering an opportunity for each and every person who's here to lay things before God in your heart and in your life, uh, to set things straight with Him. Um, this, uh, this past week, actually it was yesterday, uh, before I picked Tom up at the airport, uh, I did a memorial service uh, for someone that was a part of our church uh, a few years back. And uh, it was uh, quite a reminder as I was standing there and uh, watching them uh, lower that coffin down into the grave that uh, we have today. Uh, we don't know if we have tomorrow. And I pray that we will do something with today. Um, Friday night, uh, we watched uh, Christopher Robbins movie night. And... Uh, I don't know if this is this is like uh, the right thing to say biblically or not, but Winnie the Pooh had some very astute words to say. Uh, something to the effect uh, is that we should appreciate today because that's mostly what we get is today. Yeah, and uh, I thought, wow, there's some wisdom in that little bear. <laughs> um, let's uh, let's live out the wisdom of God's word this week. Uh, will you pray with me uh, as we uh, finish our time together? Father, uh, I just want to thank you so much for your love and your grace. I uh, thank you for the salvation that has been made possible. 
through your son, Jesus Christ, and what he did. Thank you for not just laying an invitation before us, uh, Father, but uh, thank you for living in us. Uh, those prepositions, like Tom said, are so important. We thank you for that, that blessing and that promise. And I pray, Father, that if there's someone here this morning who has not placed uh, their faith and trust in you and what Jesus did on the cross as payment for their sins, that that decision will be made before they leave. Father, thank you for all you do for us, all you have done for us, and all that you will do. And I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you stand with me for just a moment and let's read our closing passage of scripture in Psalm 1914 and it, the scripture says may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you O Lord my rock and my redeemer praise God bless you guys All right.